So today we will be talking about mind-body medicine and how it impacts self-care. What I would uh, tell you is I frequently get asked um, exactly what is mind-body medicine or what do you mean by mind-body medicine and how in the world does that ever relate to surgical services, right? It seems like there are two polar opposites, right? We have surgery, we heal with steel, and mind-body medicine is all about uh, this internal wisdom of the body, tapping into self and self-healing and using uh, all of those elements that we are born with and it's our human experience to heal. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but I'd first like to share a little bit about uh, my journey and my evolution in my career. So I started out as a staff nurse in the operating room and I went back to school for my master's degree and started advancing in my career. And so I went from manager to director to, um, you know, as, as administrative director. And I had, you know, more departments and then soon more facilities and, and more services outside of surgery, such as inpatient surgical floors. So my span was growing uh, rather large and I was advancing in my career. And I think that's all the things that we, we try to, to shoot for, right, is, is to grow in our careers. Except uh, I was not doing well. Although we looked on the outside that everything was going well, I was not. Uh, I noticed that uh, my self-care was totally falling off by the wayside. Uh, my sleep patterns were off. I found myself waking up frequently at two o'clock in the morning with a work problem on my mind, trying to solve that. I'd fall back to sleep with, you know, 30 minutes before the alarm was to go off. Uh, my nutrition was, was also falling off by the wayside. I was eating more processed foods and uh, fast foods and, you know, getting home late from work and falling to sleep right after I ate dinner. Uh, my exercise was also uh, falling by the wayside as well. So I was a runner and I uh, was, you know, finding myself, I was too tired. I didn't have the nutrition for the stamina and things just kept compounding. So I was doing things what I thought were self-care. I was getting massages and facials and doing yoga retreats in the Berkshires and and nothing just really seemed to, to fit or, or fix it. And so I was working so hard, but I wasn't feeling well. Um, and so I couldn't find this support I needed in the hospital that I was working in. So I was searching for other areas outside of medicine that I was focused on, on healing myself and my self-care. And it wasn't until I came across um, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and I found James Gordon, who is the founder of the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and a group of Saybrook students out of San Francisco. Um, and that is when it all connected for me. So in 2012, I started my PhD work and I spent the next five years researching and studying mind-body medicine related to perioperative nurses and perioperative nurse leaders. So I was basically studying myself and us. I was looking at our environment. I was looking at you know, how we structure our work, uh, the relationships in our environment. And I was not only understanding how it was impacting me, but also my peers. And I was very focused on the leaders because, as we know, there's a high rate of burnout and a high rate of turnover in perioperative nursing, especially in the leadership roles. You can have interim leaderships, uh, those positions vacant for years. We just can't find the people uh, to fill them. So I really wanted to understand what was influencing all of these factors. So that's my story. Um, and then today, we're going to share the wisdom that I learned uh, over this time period, both in my career as a, a nurse in the operating room, and then also as studying from the mind-body medicine perspective. So, the pointer is not working. Okay, so 
There. Okay, so this will be our agenda today, a brief agenda. Um, I'll introduce a little bit about mind body medicine, what it is. I know my family, all when, the time when I was studying, they kept saying, I think you do something with mind body, but I really don't know what that is. So I'm going to explain that in detail. Here we're going to do a couple exercises. Okay, so now you don't have to get up out of your seat, you'll just be sitting there. This is mind work that we're going to practice. Okay, um, so just get comfortable. You can spread your stuff out and, and know that you're not gonna have to get up and run around the room or anything like that when I say the word exercise. And um, then we're gonna move on uh, to some uh, transformational uh, phenomenology and I'll explain that in relation to uh, burnout and uh, moral injury. Okay, so mind-body medicine, what is that? So let me break it down as simply as I can. Um, the body, we all know what the body is, right? It's our muscles, our skeletal system, our skin, our organs. And as OR nurses, we know this body inside and out, right? So the mind is not to be confused with the brain, right? The mind is our thoughts, emotions, and feelings. And so the mind and the body are separate, but they're inseparable. Okay, are people following along with this, right? So um, how, if we are sick, if our body is ailing or our body is in a state of uh, homeostasis or uh, we've experienced our body's experienced trauma such as a broken leg or something like that, it can influence our mind, right? Our thoughts, our feelings and emotions. And the same goes the opposite way is that if our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions are, are out of whack, it can influence our body and how our body functions. So this is the premise of mind-body medicine. And how do we get this in a state of homeostasis in the point where we can self-regulate our own body? So that's really the spirit of this discussion is understanding how we can tap into the wisdom of our own body. You are already perfect as you are. You have everything that you need. Um, we just have to figure out how to um, exercise those, those skills that you already have. Okay. So how do we connect these two? Um, we connect the primary uh, principle in mind-body medicine is that the breath is the bridge between the mind and the body. So if you want to connect them, it's through very deliberate and paced breath work. And we're going to experience some of that today. So examples of mind-body medicine that classic have been around for centuries, right? And so it's, you know, obviously meditation and some of the, the, uh, the soft belly breathing exercise that we will do is a form of very simple meditation. Uh, there is uh, hypnosis, which is a more advanced mind-body medicine technique, and, and I do that with clients uh, for uh, whether it's chronic pain, uh, oncology, uh, stress management, uh, and just really sometimes just focusing on their next career goals. Uh, that, that can be a way to, to, to use hypnosis. Uh, biofeedback is really an essential part of this. And so uh, when I was in school, we used uh, EEGs and EKGs and pulse oximeters and, and that type of uh, uh, equipment, but you can use your smartphones or there's these bio rings that you have. So as you're practicing your skills that we learned today, you can track your physiology to understand how your breath work can shift. And this is what this is about. This is a form of relaxation that is very deliberate and a very deep uh, relaxation for stress management. 
Okay, basic principles of breath work. So uh, I'm just, I'm not gonna talk a lot about research. I'm just gonna you know, drop some points out there and you can pick them up as, as if you wanna learn more about it and Google them and search it. But we have our sympathetic nervous system. We all learned about that, right? That's our fright and flight. Um, when that's activated, our heart rate is elevated, our blood pressure is up, you know, we're shunting blood from our extremities. And uh, so staying in that chronic sympathetic state uh, is often what we default to in our society today, right? So we really want to try and uh, get away from this sympathetic overdrive. So the way to do that is through our parasympathetic system. And parasympathetic system is very complementary to the sympathetic. We need both. They're very essential and they balance each other for homeostasis, which is always the goal that we're trying to do. Uh, the other element about breath work is breathing. Our breathing is controlled uh, by the involuntary nervous system right? So when you were out walking about, you probably weren't thinking much about your breathing. But today, we're going to look at it through the lens of voluntary, um, the nervous system. So we're going to be doing paced and counted breath work that's going to shift your physiology. Uh, the other piece about breath work is, and this is a fundamental principle, is the vagus nerve, which is our 10th cranial nerve. Just imagine that running up through the center of the body and near and around the diaphragm, right? So when you are breathing in, your diaphragm moves. We all remember this from a and right? But I want to encourage you to visualize that as that diaphragm is going up and down, you're massaging that vagus nerve right? And that consistent massaging of the vagus nerve through very deliberate breath work activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So I'd like to say that the vagus nerve is the highway to the parasympathetic nervous system. So our goal here is always working on slowing that breath down, making your breath steeper, and that will be calming the body. So when you activate that parasympathetic nervous system, you will learn how to self-regulate yourself. And you can use this in um, if you're in a a COVID situation or a patient is, you know, crumping in the OR or if you're in a car accident or something that's really like getting you triggered, well, you can use some of these breathing skills that I'm going to teach you today to really just think about activating that sympathetic, that parasympathetic nervous system, using the body and the breath and the diaphragm to calm the body. So that's what we're going to learn today. Um, the other thing I would like to say is we have a whole room of great technology over there, right? It's expensive technology. We've got lots of disposables and capitals, and that's what the OR is all about. When I talk about this into a group of conventional medical people, they often question, okay, Peg, it is, it's free. It's too simple. How could it possibly work? So I'm here to tell you that there is uh, centuries of, of experience, both through cult, different cultures and now most recently through our conventional medical systems that is proving this. And so that's what I'm going to share with you as well. Okay, so right now we're going to start what I call the soft belly breathing exercise. This will be your first exercise. So there's some fundamental principles here. I'd like you to sit uh, back in your chair, right? You want both feet on the floor and you want to free things from your hands. You don't want to be clutching anything. You're, you're working on relaxation, right? And the other piece with um, when you're breathing exercises, the concept of closing your eyes is very important because what that does is it insulates you from all the other distractions. And I would describe this, uh, this breath work, this is an inside job right? You're learning how to self-regulate yourself. So when you focus, focus within, use imagery, use the words, use the breath work, and really focus on yourself, okay? So with the soft belly breathing, another principle is when you breathe in through your nose, right? Because your turbinates moisten the air, and then you want to exhale through your mouth, okay? So let's try this. Let's all settle in. Close your eyes, feet on the floor, hands relaxed, 
and take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. In through your nose and out through your mouth. On your next breath, just visualize the diaphragm, massaging the vagus nerve and calming the body. Breathing in and breathing out. Just relaxing the body, feeling your back on the seat of the chair, the air coming in through your nose, leaving your lungs, just calming the body. A few more deep breaths. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back into the room. How was that? Nice show of hands, good? Anybody feel relaxed? Okay. All right, so let's go. That was just a soft belly, diaphragmatic breathing, basic exercises, basic principles there, grounding your feet, opening your hands, not clutching, visualizing the diaphragm, the vagus nerve, breathing in through the nose, moistening the air, exhaling out. Okay, so now we're gonna go into some of the research. Um, Herbert Benson in the 70s started to study uh, this um, mind-body medicine concept, and he was really noted for bringing it into the conventional medical field. So he worked in Harvard, and he and his professors up in Harvard, they were kind of giving it street cred, right? He came out of Harvard, it must have something to it. So in his um, work, he identified some key characteristics that were present uh, in in the, uh, a very relaxed uh, uh, release, relaxation response state. This is different than when I remember I was telling the story about my self care, and I was thinking that relaxing was you know a glass of wine watching Netflix, right? So that's one of my favorite ways to relax. But this is different. This relaxation is about you tapping into your ability to self-regulate and change your physiology, your heart rate, your uh, blood pressure, other uh, secretions of your hormones and all of that. And this is where the healing begins. Okay, so what uh, Benson and his group from Harvard identified is, you know, we do the soft belly breathing using that diaphragm. The diaphragm does stimulate the vagus nerve. Sitting quietly in a comfortable position, you can practice this at home. It can be in a lounge chair by the pool. It can be in the car before you go into work, anywhere. Uh, essentially breathing in through your nose because you want the uh, turbinates to moisten your air, the air that comes into your lungs. If not, your mouth will be very dry uh, during these. So another good uh, principle there. And this is the simplest form of meditation. But what they also found is that if you practice this skill, this, this paced breathing, and you do it for, they recommend, you know, you know 10 minutes a day, twice a day, what happens is that it changes the frontal cortex in such a way that you get to develop a sense of distance, if you will, between you and the issues. Um, you have this space where you can um, not be so reactionary and you have time to process information. So that's the value of this simple meditation move. Uh, and I liken this to if you were at a concert, right, and you're at the concert in the front row or the mosh pit, it's a very different experience than if you're up in the balcony. Same music, different experience. So over time, practicing this will give you that ability to not be so reactionary. Because what have we learned over this time is we can't control any of these external factors that are driving our stress we can only control ourselves. So these are some key points in helping to control and self-regulate your response to stress. 
Okay, another concept that came out of the 90s is that they were starting to follow Benson's work and a group of scientists in the Midwest identified this theory. They call it the polyvagal theory. And in this, they uh, discovered that if you can practice paced breathing exercises where the exhale is longer than the inhale, you will activate the ventral branch of the vagus nerve. And what that does is at, at like in a very nuanced way addresses the head and neck areas. And so through pace breathing where the exhale, and we're gonna practice this is longer than the inhale, um, that ventral branch controls uh, your head and neck responses. And so what that looks like is uh, your facial muscles begin to relax. Your voice changes in pitch and tone. And your hearing filters out background no noises and is more drawn to the human voice. And they call this the social engagement theory. And this is where through these breathing exercises where the exhale is longer than the inhale, um, this makes you more, people are more able to approach you because your face is more relaxed, your voice is attracting to, to other humans, and then also you're hearing, you're seeking out that human voice. So why is this so important? This is all about people with chronic stress and uh, burnout and, um, you know, more, of course, the moral injury that we'll talk more about later, their first response is isolation. They like to isolate themselves, and that's how they treat themselves. That's how they diffuse from stress. So they isolate themselves from perhaps friends, uh, for, you know, talking to people. And I myself, I did this. I just couldn't hear another story. I just didn't want to hear more people when I was exhausted at the end of the day, right? And maybe some of you can relate to this. So, and this did come out in my research as well when I was studying perioperative nurses and perioperative nurse leaders, their number one default is to isolate themselves. And we know what happened in this pandemic and the results of isolation, right? We've learned that about our mental health and our, our well being. So, practicing this could be an opportunity for you to refocus and, and, and think about that social engagement activation that happens when we activate that ventral branch of the parasympathetic nervous system and is through this uh, breathing exercise. Okay, so we're gonna, this is another exercise we're gonna do, we're on to point two. And this is the four, seven, eight breathing exercise. This goes, you're gonna breathe in for four, you're gonna hold for seven, and then you're gonna exhale for eight. So there's a couple nuances with this. You're going to keep the, the tip of your tongue, you're gonna find the roof of your mouth with the tip of your tongue and find where the soft and the hard palate meet. You all find that place on the roof of your mouth. You're gonna hold your tongue there during these, this breathing cycle. We're only gonna do four cycles, so it's not gonna be long. But the purpose of this is that in Buddhist tradition and yoga cultures, this is how you attain focus and enlightenment. And holding that tongue there uh, in that position, right where that soft and hard palate meet, you'll breathe in for four, hold for seven, and release for eight. Okay, and then once you finish, and I'm gonna count for the first two cycles because I know that this is very unique for people and they haven't done this and it's unfamiliar. So you'll do, I'll count with you, you'll do your first two cycles and then I'll stop counting and then you, you know, go your four, and for four, one for seven and count in your head because I don't want to distract you. But when you finish your fourth cycle, just keep your eyes closed and go back to soft belly breathing. And I want you to be aware, begin to develop an awareness of somatic responses that come up when you're in these uh, and doing this breath work. So this is where the wisdom of the body emerges and it happens over time in practice and you might not feel anything in the beginning. Okay, so we're gonna try this. Is everybody ready? 
So we're gonna build on the principles that we learned in soft belly breathing. You're gonna assume a comfortable pose. You're gonna have your feet flat on the floor, palms open, right? Uh, closing your eyes, right? Because we want to decrease the stimuli. This is an inside job. Find the roof of your mouth with the tip of your tongue. And here we go. Breathe in for four. One, two, three, four. Hold for seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale for eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In for four, one, two, three, four. Hold for seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale for eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two more cycles on your own. Keeping the tongue, the roof of the mouth, And when you finish your last cycle, keep your eyes closed, release your tongue, and go back to soft belly breathing. Just relaxing the body, calming the body. Imagine that diaphragm <coughs> relaxing. And when you're ready, Come back into the room. How was that? Pretty amazing. Uh, doing this, you only want to do this four cycles at a time, never more than eight, right? Uh, and you do this uh, two to three times uh, a day. Raymond Weil will tell you that this is uh, perhaps one of the most transformative exercises that you can do after practicing for three months. And Raymond Weil is the center. He uh, operates uh, the Institute of Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. So he comes out of traditional uh, conventional medicine that we know, but very much integrates uh, this into, into his practice. Okay, so the next exercise, I told you we're full of exercises here, right? <laughs> Already, is autogenic training. Autogenic training, this, now we were in the 80s and the 90s with, you know, Benson's work and, and, and all of that, and the polyvagal theory. Now we're going to go back to the 1920s. And in the 1920s, a group of German uh, physicians and researchers was looking at hypnosis and uh, biofeedback coupled together. So hypnosis is another mind-body medicine skill, and it, uh, it has very specific uh, steps. So for instance, um, there's an induction phase, just like anesthesia. So when I use hypnosis on somebody, there's an induction phase that I use with the client. Um, some of you, know, you might seen some goofy movies where it's the pendulum, right? The swinging and that's how they get them, you know, uh, going back and forth. But I use different methods of, of induction. And then there's progressive relaxation and some a language that you, you know, select with the client to, that they wish to change in their hypnosis session. And then there's some anchoring thoughts. And one of the key principles that I've noticed in hip hypnosis, and this is, you know, how you tell if you've had a successful uh, session, is that there's this warped sense of time. So with my clients, I always have them write down the time that we start the session in their handwriting and a pad in front of them. And when we finish, invariably, you know, they think 10 minutes has passed by and it's really been, you know, a little over an hour. So that sense of loss of time is a key element, and we'll bring that up later when we talk about moral injury. Okay, so autogenic training coming out of the 20s from a group of researchers in Germany with hypnosis and uh, biofeedback. Now, biofeedback is those external indicators that tell you how your physiology is shifting, right? Uh, like I said, we used EEGs and EKGs in school, but you can use your smartphones or your O-rings or things like that to tell you how your heart rate, blood pressure, and all that is going. 
So we're going to practice this autogenic training exercise. I'm actually going to use a script that they used back then. Okay, so this is time tested. And this is one of the greatest self help things that you could do for yourself to promote deep relaxation, not the wine and Netflix relaxation. This is the deep relaxation, right? So I'm going to, there is a series of six sentences and I'm going to read the sentence and then I'm going to pause for a minute and you are going to internalize that sentence and tell yourself this sentence. So I will read the sentence six times in a row. Okay. And then I'll move to the next sentence. And that whole time you want to sit in your pose that you've learned this sitting in the chair, find your know, feet on the floor, hands relaxed, soft belly breathing this whole time, just in and out, calm breathing, okay? So here we go. We're gonna try this autogenic training and the exercise is from the 20s. So I think that you'll, you'll really enjoy this. The other piece is when I finish uh, reading the series of sentences, keep your eyes closed, right? Focus on what's happening in your body, soft belly breathing, and see what comes up for you. So the somatic triggers tend to arise when we are in this deep state of relaxation. And it's typically where we hold our stress. You know, all of a sudden to be sitting there on oh, my shoulder or my back or my knee. Pay attention to that. That's the wisdom of the body. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna have you find your pose. Okay, you're going to be doing soft belly breathing, close your eyes, and here we go. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. <clears throat> My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My abdomen radiates warmth. I am at peace. My abdomen radiates warmth. I am at peace. 
my abdomen radiates warmth. I am at peace. My abdomen radiates warmth. I am at peace. My abdomen radiates warmth. I am at peace. My abdomen radiates warmth. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. Keeping your eyes closed, continue with your soft belly breathing. Visualize yourself being healthy, strong, and happy. Remain in this deeply relaxed state as long as you like. And when you're ready to bring yourself back into the room, start to move your wrists and pump your fists to kind of get the circulation going. Circle your ankles. A few deep breaths. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come back into the room. Okay. Show of hands. How was that for people? Was that relaxing? Could you feel the warmth and the heaviness? Those two elements, what these researchers out of Germany found is that those two elements are the elements present during a hypnosis session that are required for you to go into deep relaxation. Now, let me be clear, I did not hypnotize anybody, okay? <laughs> like I said in the beginning, hypnosis is a, is a very deliberate, um, you know, there's an induction period and there's, you know, some language that the client uses. And this is not about, you know, a monkey dancing on the stage like or people acting like a monkey, however that goes. So this progressive relaxation exercise, you can, there are apps out there that you can uh, sign up for. Uh, there are YouTube visit videos. This is very profound in healing. And so this is the kind of relaxation that will really shift your physiology. Use your smartphone or some of those O-rings, you know, the, the biometric rings that people have in monitored their sleep and all of that. You can do this, it's a great exercise to do at two o'clock in the morning when you can't get back to sleep. And you can just progressively think about your arms and then your legs being heavy and your heartbeat and, and your abdomen. You can do this yourself so that you can help self-regulate your response to stress, okay? 
All right, we have one more exercise, and that's a guided imagery exercise. And we've heard a lot about guided imagery. It's been used, as I said, for it's a time tested and a uh, very reliable source uh, for healing. What I use guided imagery for is it's great for chronic pain patients. And um, they would go through you know, some breathing cycles and, and steps that you just learned today. And we would focus on perhaps where their pain is located. And we might assign a color to that pain or we might assign a shape to that where they feel their pain. And we imagine together through phrases and breathing that we shrink the area of where the pain is, or we might soften the color if it starts out as bright orange, we might visualize that pain going to a softer orange, maybe to a pale pink. And the guided imagery is a, is a profound way to heal your body through this mind-body medicine technique. So we're gonna do this in a different fun way. And so the reason uh, I think adults, you know, are, are kind of resistant to this is that we live in a rule-based world, right? Especially in the OR, we have policies, procedures, uh, protocols, you know, every step has a, a script to it, right? Whether it's our timeout, our debriefing, how we identify a patient, all of those are hardwired steps. And we use that side of the brain in this rule-based world. I want to challenge you to go to that other playful side, to be imaginative, to use your imagination and do more of that to, to find a way to, to begin healing through um, burnout and moral injury, which we've all experienced. Okay, so we're going to do this guided imagery exercise. This is fun. Um, and so uh, I picked this one specifically because I want to kind of perk you up a little bit after you've been all relaxed and not sitting limp in your chair. Okay. So what I'll have you do is again, uh, just assume the posture that we learned at the very beginning, your pose, you're going to sit with your feet flat on the floor, your palms uh, free. You're going to close your eyes, right? Because visualization is all about how you are visualizing your body. And we're going to have you go through this uh, little exercise, and then I'll be interested to see, um, you know, how you experience this. Okay, so close your eyes, a few deep breaths, and here we go with our guided imagery exercise. Okay, take a deep breath, allow your eyes to close softly. I would like you to imagine now that you are standing in your kitchen or the kitchen of someone you know. In front of you is a cutting board. Next to the cutting board is a good sharp knife. Take a few moments to look around the kitchen. The color of the countertops the appliances, the cabinets, are there any windows? Notice any particular kitchen smells or sounds? The running of the dishwasher, or the hum of the refrigerator, or the sound of a clock on the wall. Take some time to notice everything in and around the kitchen using all of your senses, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, and how you feel being there in that kitchen. Now imagine that on the cutting board sits a plump, fresh, juicy lemon. In your mind, hold the lemon in one hand. Feel its weight. Can you feel the texture? Then place it back on the cutting board and carefully cut the lemon in half with the knife. 
Feel the resistance to the knife? Does it give way as it enters the inner peel? Have you cut through a seed or two? Carefully cut one of the halves in two. You see any juice running from the lemon? Now imagine lifting this lemon wedge to your mouth, smelling that sharp, fresh scent. Now take a bite into the sour, juicy pulp. Keeping your eyes closed. A few more deep breaths. And when you're ready, come back into the room. Open your eyes. Show of hands, who puckered? <laughs> That's the power of guided imagery. Okay, it's the combination of phrases and imagery that can uh, create a response, a physiological response. It's great for healing. Uh, it is also important to be mindful of the language that you use with imagery. Uh, we do this ourselves when we tell our own story. We tell and we use the same imagery and the language and we might tell ourselves things that are not true. So one example I always think of is when I was growing up and I can remember being seven years old, sitting at my kitchen table with my father and my uncles. And they said, hey, girls aren't good with math. You know, you're never going to do good with math. Right. So it's that language and you imagine it and it's over time and it sticks with you. Right. And I had spent a lot of time getting over that language that was kind of creating the imagery in me. Another powerful way is that if you ask really successful people about, you know, wow, what was the secret to your success, CEOs or sports, you know, athletes, and they will tell you, I have never seen it any other way. They hold that vision of what they want, what they want to be, and this could be you in your next job, in your next role, whether it's, you know, grandmother or parent or friend, wherever you see yourself going, using that positive language is so powerful. Combining that with imagery is, it will help you shift into what you want to achieve. So that's what I'd like to say about guided imagery. I'm glad we got a chance to experience that. Next is, this is where my research is taking me now. Uh, transformative phenomenology and moral uh, injury. So um, just briefly about moral injury and, and burnout. So burnout has been in the nursing literature for decades, right? Uh, we've been hearing about it, the compassion fatigue and the burnout. And burnout has some really classic hallmarks of, you know, you're just not engaged in your work. Um, you're kind of empathetic. You can't put your whole self into your job. And you're just, you know, not really wanting to be there. And that's that burnout phase. Moral injury is very, very different. Moral injury is deeply personal and it's unique for everybody. But moral injury is where you, uh, your value system has been tested and challenged and you, uh, you, you no longer trust your judgments, you don't trust your purpose, and it's difficult for you to find meaning and purpose in life. So we we'll go back to the 90s and when um, the military started looking at uh, our military leaders and soldiers coming back from war, uh, they were really noticing that they were having a difficult time integrating. And what was happening is they were having a, a tough time with whether they were tasked with the duties that were assigned to them and they were you know, bound by duty with being in the military. Uh, or whether it was the circumstances. The circumstances, there was no other choice and they were in this it, situation that they had to do something, a task or be involved in an event that totally went against their grain, their, their moral compass. 
And so that's what moral injury is. And in moral injury, there's two emotions that really bubble to the surface. It's fear and anger. And fear and anger are very prevalent with people that are experiencing moral injury. And to boot to that is that it erodes your ability to trust. So here we are in our society right now, you know, we can, the fear and um, the anger are palpable. We are, the, the lack of trust is palpable, whether it's for politicians, police, our environment, uh, it, it, it goes across the board. And so I think that in this pandemic, we have all experienced loss, some more than others. And I know as OR nurses, I was out in California when the pandemic first hit and there was a, the supply chain, right? There were no supplies. We would never have thought of reusing N95 masks. That was going against our grain. We were taking people and we were in New, in New York and Northern New Jersey, they were putting two people on one ventilator with COVID in an OR. Um, we were asked to, to go to areas to provide nursing care that we had no competencies in. And the leaders suffered as that as well because they were assigning their staff, you know, go up on the floor and, and help in these COVID rooms, you know, get all geared up. And nobody understood what was going on. We weren't competent. Uh, and that was a form of moral injury. So we've all experienced it. And here we are. Now, how do we get out of this? And how do we move on? We're never going to go back to the way it was, but we have to move through this. And so this is where my research is taking me now. So transformative phenomenology. So the way I would describe phenomenology is it's different for everybody. It is the way you assign meaning and purpose to an issue or an event or an experience. And so it's, that's why it's unique for everybody. And the simplest way that I can describe phenomenology is uh, liken it to goosebumps. What gives you goosebumps? And so that is how you respond to something that is, you know, an experience or an event that you assign great meaning and purpose to, and it shifts your physiology. Right? So that's the important piece here. And transformative physiology can shift your cellular level, right? And that's what you're going for. You're, you're, you're trying to reboot and get out of this state of moral injury. Okay, so this is what the research is telling us now of how we get out of moral injury. I would tell you that you should focus on things that light you up and go in search of all. And one of the things that, and people will tell you what lights you up. And I know people tell me this all the time. When I talk about my kids or the dogs, they say, Peg, your face lights up. <laughs> when, if people tell you that and you know what that is, do more of that. That's what's gonna help you heal. Staying in that positive, in that positive light, staying lit up. In search of all, go find things that are bigger than you. It doesn't have to be the Aurora Borealis. You know, it could be walk, taking a walk under the full moon at night. It could be, um, you know, watching a, a new puppy. It, it doesn't have to be huge, but do something that all inspiring to you. A lot of people find that gratitude and giving are also great ways that make you feel better on a cellular level when you give. So, you know, volunteering at a soup kitchen, um, you know, doing a clothing drive, things like that will definitely help you shift out of this moral injury. One of my favorite balancers for wellness is spending time in nature. Nature is very healing. And I think John Muir put it the best, you know, into the woods I go to lose my mind and find my soul. You want to find things that are so closely aligned to you that you feel your your best at, the, at that environment. It doesn't have to be the woods. It can be the beach. It, it can be anywhere. And you don't have to be, 
you know, in a forest, you can start bringing plants into your studio apartment, surrounding yourself with neighbors, putting uh, with uh, plants in your studio apartment, uh, with uh, fruit on the table and flowers. It could be sharing things with, with neighbors, right? Sharing flowers. Anything with nature is normally human for us. So do more of that. The other component is getting lost in time. What is that thing that you do, and it's different for everybody, where you get the feeling that you have lost sense of time? So for me, it's gardening. I go out to the garden, I start in the morning, and before I know it, it's in the afternoon. When that happens, all of that mental chatter falls off and it's silenced. And so you are more engaged in mind, body, in that activity of what you're doing and that stuff that's going on in your head, that loop that we all feel we're caught in, it falls by the wayside. So getting lost in time, it could be putting puzzles together. It could be, you know, playing a mus musical instrument. It could be, um, you know, painting, uh, knitting, anything like that, where you feel like you lose the sense of time, like, and you're doing something, you're like, I don't realize all this time passed. Now go back to what I talked about hypnosis. One of the key elements when I use hypnosis with my clients, I always ask them to write down that time. And then they go through their deep relaxation state. The one thing they all are marked on is that how much time has actually passed. They've lost a sense of time. And that's a key element here. You can do that yourself without being hypnotized. Just do an activity, find out what that is, where you lose that sense of time, and do more of that. If you don't have an activity that does that for you, I challenge you to find something you know nothing about and do that. I also did this. I was so stressed and I, I couldn't think of anything that was I would lose that sense of time with. So I took up glass blowing lessons. I knew nothing about it. My whole focus had to be on that. And by the end of the day, I was so relaxed because I challenged myself to do something I knew nothing about. So another good key for helping with moral injury. Trusting in the wisdom of the body. Our bodies are innately filled with wisdom. And when you go through these breathing exercises and guided imageries and autogenic training, pay attention to the somatic markers that come up as you're going through them. It will take you time to feel comfortable with this. It's not gonna happen right away, but this is so powerful and healing. So pay attention to that wisdom of the body. The other piece is sharing your stories like I'm doing with you. It has a way of reducing that sense of isolation and that is so important for us right now. It doesn't have to be big and bold. It could be, you know, striking up a conversation with, you know, someone who works in the parking garage or just finding that alliance and, and sharing your story and touching base with others. It's you know, rooted in narrative medicine and I'm a narrative researcher, so I love to hear the stories and finding those unifying themes. Those are so healing. So do more of that. Find you know, your, your people that you can share things with and reduce your sense of isolation is another step to help with moral injury. Okay, so there we have it, all the exercises to, to help you in guiding your self-care for self-regulation. Um, there are, you know, apps out there, and I, I don't like to recommend uh, any particular app because what I say is that the most important thing when you find an app for either guided imagery, autogenic training, or meditation, you have to be drawn to the sound of the voice of the person who's doing it. So I've listened to some really strong thought leaders in these areas, and I just could not focus because their voice was not attractive to me. So listen to them and, and find something that you like. And, and if you want, you can even have a friend record it and you could use their voice and, and play that on your phone, that autogenic training at two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Okay, so there we have it. I thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you.
Do we have any time for questions? Okay, great. Questions, anyone? I Thank you for uh, talking about moral injury. Uh, most of the things you read now about moral injury are physician feedback and physician being affected by moral injury, and I appreciate the fact that you're losing nursing moral injuries. Thank you. Welcome. Question here. Okay. I actually want to make a comment too about the moral injury. I think a lot of y'all will know that I'm hospital closed. And I think that a lot of I think a lot of our medical workers are experiencing that moral injury. And I wish I could go back and share what I've just learned today mm -hmm. to help them to resolve some of that. Because a lot of people are wanting to leave the organization just because of that moral injury feeling. Right. So thank you for sure. the It's very real. It, it is real. So one thing I would tell you, including this physician, because yes. everybody was shocked at how we learned about it was on social media. The majority of us. We didn't learn from the organization, but uh, the executives we learned about it on social media. The key element here is this is humanistic, right? This is human behavior. The, the, how the body responds. And then you can definitely go back and use some of these exercises, get people in a small group, like I had the campfire stories, and just start sharing your stories. 